please join me in our call to worship. On the evening of Jesus' resurrection, the disciples were gathered in fear. The risen Christ appeared in their midst and said, peace be with you. We come today, some of us filled with joy, some of us filled with fear, and to each one of us, Christ says, peace be with you. Let us enter into Christ's peace as we worship God together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you hear us when we speak to you. You teach us when we seek to learn from you. You show us signs of your presence when we draw near to you. And so open our minds and our hearts to see you and hear you and learn from you as we seek your presence this hour. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. So let us confess our sins before God and each other, first praying silently and then joining together in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. 
wondrous God, you have broken the power of sin and death, and by your great mercy you have borne in us a living hope. Yet seeds of doubt grow quickly in our hearts. Her chokes our confidence and we grasp onto what we know rather than reach for you. Forgive us, O God, and in your great mercy grant us the peace that passes understanding. Draw us close to you that we may breathe deeply of your unfathomable grace and know that you are with us now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. See, the new has become. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter nine, chapter 20. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 34. Listen to the word of our Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven you. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I'll believe it when I see it. How many times have we uttered those words? And whether we're talking about our faith or about life, don't we always want proof? Don't we want verifiable, physical, tangible proof? Otherwise, we say, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, it's Easter night and the disciples are demoralized and huddled together in fear and probably in the same room in which they were when they shared the Last Supper together. Everyone knows who Jesus' followers are. They all could identify them, point them out, and both the Roman officials and the Jews were angry and couldn't wait to be rid of them. So at any moment, they expected that the doors would be burst open and they would suffer the same fate as their teacher and friend. 
but they never expected Jesus to appear among them. So when he appears, they're shocked. They think it's an apparition and their eyes are deceiving them. Is this really Jesus or is it an imposter? And in response to their doubt, Jesus shows them the marks of his crucifixion. But Thomas wasn't there at the moment. Where he was, we don't know because John doesn't tell us. But he returns to that room and the disciples are all excited to seeing their risen Lord. And they tell them, they tell him about that. And they tell him about the meeting and how Jesus had them put his finger in the holes on his hands and in the wound on his side. But second reports weren't enough. He wants evidence. He won't believe it till he sees it. Frankly, I think Thomas has been given a bad rap over the years because of truth be told, there are many times we doubt too. Couldn't the same thing be said about us? Don't we wrestle with our doubts and our fears and don't we try to cling to whatever faith we have? as little as that may be at times. If we'd been in that room with Thomas, wouldn't we too have said, show me? But John wrote this gospel 90 years or more after Jesus' death, and in part he did it because it was a time of turmoil for the early Christian church, and everything at that point was hearsay. So did, there, did Jesus' resurrection really take place? Did God really agree to go to a cross and die in that way? Was it possible that Jesus just appeared to die, but didn't really? These were the questions that were plaguing the early church, and John includes a story in his gospel to provide a definitive answer. And the truth is, those questions still plague us too. And Thomas reassures us that our doubts aren't bad, in and of themselves. In fact, they're necessary if we're going to grow in our faith, because it's when we doubt that we ask questions and seek answers. And it's in our seeking that we glean the truth. Barbara Brown Taylor wrote a book called Leaving Church, and she wrote it to chronicle the decision that she made from being a parish priest in an Episcopal church to going on and being a professor of preaching at a local college. She was interviewed about her decision and about the book and was asked, was it in part because of the doubts that she had? I love her response. She says, doubt often brings me to poke at what I believe. And when what I poke at topples, then I realize that what I believed had really become an idol. And so doubt has been a divine gift that has led me, that has led me into a deeper relationship with God. And I think that's true for all of us, that our doubt can lead us into a deeper relationship with God. Because when you think about it, it's during those times that we wrestle with doubt and ask God to be present in our questions that we grow in our relationship with God. Taylor continues, John's problem, that is the author of this gospel who tells the story of Thomas, is a continuing problem for the church. And his problem was how to encourage people of faith when Jesus was no longer with them, was no longer present in the flesh to them. And the story of Thomas gave way for John to be able to do that because by detailing his doubt, John takes the words right out of our mouth and puts them into Thomas's mouth, Taylor says, so that each one of us then has the opportunity to think about what it is that we do or don't believe and how our doubts become the stepping stones of our faith. Thomas' story is filled with examples of this. We all remember when Jesus had let Lazarus die before he came to him and resurrected him. And he told the disciples he was going to need to go to Bethany even after Lazarus had died. 
in order for God to be glorified. And the disciples didn't want him to go because they remembered that the last time he had been in Bethany, he had almost been stoned to death. And so they discourage him from going. But it's Thomas who speaks up and says, let us also go that we might die with you. And they go. And then at the Last Supper, after Jesus has washed their feet and they've shared in communion together, Jesus goes on and preaches them his last sermon and instructs them on things he wants them to know about. And one of those is the fact that he would have to go on and die, but that he was going to go ahead of them. And there was going to be this house with many rooms and he would go ahead and prepare a place for them and he would know the way. It's Thomas who speaks up and says, but we don't know the way. How can we know the way? And that's when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. But Thomas wasn't going to leave anything to chance. He was a carpenter by trade. He knew that details mattered. Measurements had to be precise so that what he made would be durable and lasting. And that need for precision spilled over into his faith life too. He wanted to know all the details, the fine points of what Jesus was saying. He wanted to get straight. And then once he faced his doubts and sought his God, he moved forward with conviction. And that's how we grow in our faith. And so Frederick Beekner famously proclaimed, if you don't have doubts, you're either kidding yourself or you're asleep, because doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it alive and moving. And what he means by that is that faith isn't the absence of doubt, but it's choosing to turn to God in the midst of our doubts and trust that God is there. And then to get up and leave behind us whatever has locked us in and walk forward in faith. And that's exactly what Thomas did. Jesus comes to the upper room a second time. And when he appears, he goes right to Thomas. There's no pretense. There are no words of introduction other than, once again, peace be with you. He walks right to Thomas and he says to him, put your fingers in the holes of the nails and your hand on my side so that you will believe. But Thomas never does. Instead, he falls at Jesus' feet and worships his Lord. And from that day forward, he never looks back. Just as with Joseph of Arimathea, there are a number of legends about Thomas. He purportedly spread the gospel to India and even built seven churches there. And in the Acts of Thomas, which is an apocryphal book that isn't contained in our canon in the Bible as we know it, we're told that he first went to India as a slave. He was brought to build a palace for the king, King Gandhaphorus. And the king gave him everything he needed, all of the supplies, all of the money that he had asked for. And he was to build this wonderful palace for the king. But a couple of years passed and this palace, as far as the king knew, still wasn't built. And he insisted on seeing it. And at that point, Thomas said to the king, well, I never did build it. I gave that money that you gave me to the poor. The king was furious, but Thomas preached the gospel to him and did it so convincingly that the king became a Christian and he forgave Thomas for what he did and Thomas's life was spared. So what does Thomas's story mean for us on this side of the resurrection? Well, during the week, I looked for illustrations of people who doubted their faith and then through their doubts came to belief in God. Of course, we all know the story of C.S. Lewis and how he was one of those people. But I realized that 
not one of them was as compelling as the examples we have here right among us in our own family of faith here at Newtown Square Presbyterian Church. And as I thought about those of you who I know whose faith runs deep, in every case I know that that faith was hard fought, that faith always comes as a result of wrestling with God. Bill McDavid came to mind, who you all know passed away earlier this week. He knew God had prepared a place for him, but he still doubted. And I'm sharing this not because I'm telling you a tale out of school, but because Bill asked me to share this with you. He wanted you to know that for him, doubt and faith were all wrapped up in one messy package. And while he wanted to be with his Lord, he also wanted to keep a foothold here on earth because this was what he could see and hear and taste and touch. But the only way to get to heaven is to take that leap between doubt and faith and trust that the one who's standing on the other side is the same God who's standing on this side too, who walks with us now through thick and thin. As Bill and I talked about his life and some of his regrets and times of misunderstanding and confusion and doubt that he had. Bill admitted there were times he wanted proof. And we talked about this passage about Thomas and his doubts, and we did it the night before Bill died. We talked about how those doubts were stepping stones on Thomas's way to faith and he wasn't afraid to ask questions. He wasn't afraid to challenge God. He knew what he needed in order to take a leap of faith and Jesus knew it too. And so Jesus came to him and his presence alone was all that he needed. Bill started to recite the 23rd Psalm and I joined him and we came to that passage. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. And I could feel Bill beginning to relax. And then we continued, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And Bill was ready. When we ended the phone call, Bill was ready to meet his Lord. And less than 24 hours later, he did. What is on this side of life, but just a moment in time, it's all an anticipation of what's to come for eternity. Of course, we're bombarded with distractions, with things to do, places to go, our fears and our doubts that threaten to lock us within ourselves and to keep our faith at bay. We all have questions, we all have doubts, we all want details of what heaven looks like and how we get there. And notice that Jesus never rebukes Thomas for his doubts because he knows that faith and doubt aren't opposites, that they're inextricably intertwined as we seek to understand who God is and who we are in relationship to God. For we now see in a mirror dimly as we try to live as Easter people. And we should ask questions just as Bill did and just as Thomas did, because we don't have all the answers. And we will continue to have questions and until we too meet God face to face. I wish I could have been in that upper room the night Jesus appeared. And I know you do too. I would have loved to see in his face, to touch his hand, to hear his voice. We've been given a gift in Thomas and in Bill, and in fact, in the stories that each one of us shares with each other about our faith. For we know without a doubt that we have a living God who meets us right where we are, and that fearful hearts or locked doors 
or endless questions will never keep Christ's presence from us. Not now and not ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Most gracious and loving God, we are a people of promise. Thanks to your abiding grace. Have mercy upon us as you promised you would. When mediocrity has become good enough, Renew our desire to serve you with purpose and conviction. When sin has blinded us, open our eyes to see the truth. When fear and anxiety have paralyzed us, release us from their grasp and help us to take a leap of faith. We know we can count on you, O Lord, for you have revealed to us in the pages of Scripture just who you are, the one who brings order out of chaos and life out of emptiness the one who in the fullness of time came to us in the person of Jesus to defend those who have no other protector, to heal the sick and bind up the brokenhearted, to call the able, the willing, and even the unwilling, and to walk with us all, even through the valley of the shadow of death. So be with us now, O God, mend our brokenness, be with those who are suffering loss, or facing death or destruction, or recovering from illness, or searching for meaning during these difficult days. And be with those who we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts.
to pour out your life-giving spirit on each of us and fill those we've named and those who go unnamed with your healing presence and power. And remind each of us that you have suffered in every way that we possibly could and are ready to hear our pleas and calm our troubled hearts. And be with our nation, O oh God, as we look for a timeline to resume activities and businesses and some normalcy in our lives, knowing that life will be forever changed by this pandemic and the destruction it leaves behind. Give clarity to our leaders, our health professionals, the doctors and nurses and researchers and volunteers who are dedicating their lives for our well-being. May our leaders around the globe seek your wisdom as countries try to put back the pieces of a fractured world. And yet may the efforts be according to your timing, that resurgence of illness won't occur and your people would be healed. Increase our faith, O oh God, as we pray for a stop to this pandemic and for your healing mercies for individuals, our families, our church, our world. For we know that even a mustard seed of faith can move mountains. Gather us in your fold, show us your way, your truth and your life, that we would serve you with joy as you have shown us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God, and in God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.